names of the people joining us today. I feel like we have a very international public, so we'll be asking about that in a moment. And I'm very happy that you'll be joining us today. Um, our department looks for the creation of a dialogue internationally where we can create space uh, to have an exchange of ideas and, and development on the research fields to support our, our faculty staff and international network. So I'm very pleased to have our international presenter today as well, David Wright. Thank you very much for joining us today and we're very pleased to, to have you virtually over here visiting us and, and all the people joining us today. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Jose Luis Poblete and I'm a professor at the Faculty of Humanities at, at Universidad Santiago and I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Wright. So David Wright is a forensic linguist and lecturer at Nottingham Trent University. His research uh, applies methods of corpus linguistics and discourse analysis in forensic contexts and aims to help improve the delivery of justice using language analysis. His research spans across a range of intersections between language and the law and justice, language and crime, and evidence and discourses of abuse, harassment, and discrimination. So in this talk, Dr. Wright will introduce the field of forensic linguistics and outline the main areas of research and practice in the field, such as authorship analysis, forensic speech science, discourse and legal context. Drawing on examples, he will discuss in detail some of the challenges that forensic linguists face and how developments in research can help address them. So before we start, there is a really short survey with two questions, right? Hay una pequeña encuesta para que puedan contestar. Así que muchas gracias. So I think you should have enough time to answer it because there are just two questions. So David, thank you for joining us. So please. Okay, thank you for those uh, introductions. I'll just share my screen. <clears throat> Jose, can you see that? Yep. Yes, I can see that. Okay, wonderful. So I'll, uh, I'll just go ahead then. Um, first of all, thank you to the uh, University of Santiago and Jose for the invitation to give this talk today. Uh, also, thank you all who've taken time out of your day uh, to uh, watch or listen to me. I hope everyone's well and safe and healthy in the uh, current circumstances. Um, so yes, uh, I don't want to repeat necessarily the introductions that I've had, but um, my name is David Wright. I'm a senior lecturer at Nottingham Trent University and I've worked there um, since 2014. Uh, I completed my undergraduate and master's stu studies at the University of Leeds before completing my PhD there under the supervision of Dr. Alison May, who some of you might know as uh, Dr. Alison Johnson. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit of background as to how this came about. Um, Jose and I met last year um, when he traveled to Nottingham for the International Summer School in Forensic Linguistic Analysis. And we had a lengthy chat one afternoon and I learned that um, there was some interest in forensic linguistics uh, over in, in Chile. It was beginning to emerge as a field of specialist language study and I was fascinated to hear about the enthusiasm and interest that it was attracting. Um, and although, um, as was as just said earlier, I understand that the audience is very much international here, and it may be the same in many of your own countries, that forensic linguistics might be something that you've heard of, um, either through uh, academic work or on the television. Um, so hopefully I can shed some light on that today. Um, so in light of that, I've pitched this talk on the whole to be uh, quite introductory in nature. Um, so I've had a look at the list of participants and I can see uh, at least some names in there where none of this is going to be news. Um, 
I tend to, so I apologize for that, but for the rest of you, I intend to give simultaneously um, an overview of the field of forensic linguistics and give an insight into the types of work that the field comprises. And in doing so, give three short case studies uh, from different areas of the field. Um, this talk positions forensic linguistics as responding to challenges in language and the law. And those three case studies that I'll talk about over the next about 50 minutes, 45 to 50 minutes or so, uh, each represent a different type of challenge that forensic linguists are faced with. Um, every introductory text in forensic linguistics starts by giving some definition of the field. The broadest definitions tend to say that forensic linguistics is concerned with any interface or interaction between language and the law, language and crime, or language and evidence. Um, personally, I like uh, Nikki McLeod and Tim Grant's 2017 definition of forensic linguistics insofar as the stated aim of forensic linguistics is to improve the delivery of justice through language analysis. I like that definition because it's, it's functional. Um, the, in, in the introduction to the uh, 2010 Routledge Handbook of Forensic Linguistics, Malcolm Coulthard and Alison Johnson, um, now Alison May, subdivide the field into three main areas. First, well not first, but one, is the study of the written language of the law, so legal documents, legislation in its most prim uh, primary sense, but other sorts of legally binding documents. Second, the study of interaction in the legal process, and finally, the name given to the description of the work of the forensic linguist, or in fact any linguist, when acting as an expert witness in uh, primarily criminal but often also civil proceedings. This um, list of three by Malcolm and Allison is quite typical in that it defines forensic linguistics in terms of the types of work that has been done in the field. In order to give you a broad overview or a more transparent sense of the types of work that forensic linguists do in terms of research at least, um, I conducted a, a, a quick um, sort of off the cuff analysis or survey of you, if you like, of all of the articles that have been published in the International Journal of Speech, Language and the Law since its um, introductory or its first volume in 1994 when it actually went under the, the name Forensic Linguistics. Um, from 1994 until 2019, I looked at each article that had been published and I sort of give it a general categorization as to the overall broad topic that it relates to. The reason I've chosen this journal is that it's the, um, at least the first and probably primary place in which forensic linguists publish their research. It's by no means the only place that forensic linguists publish their research, um, but it, it provides a sort of a nice isolated and independent um, case study for this sort of thing. Um, so between 1994 and the end of 2019, when I uh, conducted this, uh, this, this brief analysis, uh, there were, oops, uh, daisies. There had been 280 articles published in the journal, 46% of which, or 129 of the 280, were from the broad field of forensic speech science. That's the term given to the use of phonetics, uh, phonetic and acoustic analysis in legal investigations. In there, it includes speaker comparison research, um, research of the analysis of disputed utterances, speaker profiling, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in one of the case studies in a second, voice parades, voice lineups, and speaker authentication. This accounts for almost half of the articles that have been published uh, in the journal. That gives rise to some, sometimes a distinction between, on the one hand, forensic linguistics, and on the other hand, forensic phonetics or forensic speech science. Um, the broadest definitions of forensic linguistics, including ones that I like to sort of um, assign myself to, are include forensic speech science, but some definitions do draw a distinction between linguistics insofar as where the data is primarily written and forensic phonetics or forensic speech science where the data or evidence is primarily spoken. But anyway, 
almost half of the articles that have been published in the journal have been in that field. The next slide presents a graph of the rest, the other 54% uh, of the articles published in this journal, uh, and they are split up broadly as follows. This is, these are obviously my terms. Um, I don't wish to misrepresent any of the work that anyone does in that uh, or publishes in that journal. These are my own terms. Um, joint most prolific in the journal is work in authorship analysis and work that includes some degree of interpreting or translation. Uh, authorship analysis is broadly concerned with the attempts to identify the authors of disputed or anonymous documents or texts of any kind that may be evidential in criminal or civil cases. Authorship attribution and authorship analysis was the area that I first um, engaged with in forensic linguistics. That's what I did my PhD on, uh, and it's, it's a very popular area in the field. Then we have interpreting and translation, which is the, the label that I gave to uh, articles that included any element of um, justice or evidence in a multilingual context, where it involves an interpreter or translated materials. Um, then we've got uh, work on um, legal genres, primarily written legal genres, legal documents, legal texts, varying from uh, legislation to contracts, um, terms and conditions, those sorts of things. Then we have work on courtroom discourse, um, which is the analysis of any kind of the subgenres that happen within the trial process, everything from uh, opening narratives, closing statements, cross-examination of witnesses, examination and chief of witnesses, judges, summings up. So this has been a huge area in forensic linguistics also, far beyond uh, its representation in this particular journal. Then we have this sort of survey work or case reports of or by forensic linguists who have acted as expert witnesses. In some cases, there will be reports. In other cases, there might be a more reflexive article um, in which the position as linguists as expert witnesses in criminal proceedings is assessed and evaluated. And then we have the analysis of police interviews and witness statements, which is a, a hugely popular area of forensic linguistics. It, should, it goes without saying that a lot of the data for this sort of work is very difficult to come by. Uh, in my experience and, 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 and with colleagues who work in particularly courtroom discourse and police interview data, it's very, very difficult and, to get that data, especially in England and Wales. Uh, and it's often the result of, of lengthy and long-standing relationships between the linguist or the researcher and the institutions in question. And then finally, before we have a little bit of a drop off, we have research into um, asylum and language detection. In other words, the use of linguistic analysis to attempt to identify the uh, origin or the place of socialization of an individual, particularly in asylum contexts. And then we have a subgroup of um, less well represented areas in forensic linguistics, but still very important ones. We have the use of linguistic methodologies to determine meaning, either um, meaning in uh, legislative context or statutory interpretation, or meaning in ev evidential context, for instance, the um, deduction or evaluation of particularly, particular slang uh, expressions. Then we have the analysis of threats and other malicious texts. Then we have work on the caution and legal rights, and in particular, the communication of those rights um, to individuals. That's something, again, that I talk about in more detail in a few minutes. Then the analysis of jury instructions, um, the uh, satisfactory uh, or not level of jury instructions, the instructions that jurors are given by judges in different jurisdictions. And then finally, we have surveys or overviews of the field, which may be geographical surveys in which some of the work that or some of the problems that are emerging in some areas of the world are surveyed and detailed. So that's generally speaking what the field, insofar as it's represented by its most long-standing journal, um, represents or comprises. Um, for the most part, these 15 topics are roughly divided often into two categories. On the one hand, we have research into 
the language of the law and language of the legal process. And then on the other hand, we have the analysis of language as or language in evidence. Now often, this was certainly my experience, when you first encounter the field of forensic linguistics, um, this distinction often isn't clear. And if it isn't clear, then it's made clear pretty quickly uh, wherever you're, you're being instructed or wherever you're learning about this, uh, this field. It sh I should say that some definitions of forensic linguistics um, are restricted to only that work in the yellow circle. Um, others argue that um, the language of the law and the lang language of the legal process should come under some other title or some other label than forensic linguistics. But personally, and probably generally, um, there's the, the definition of forensic linguistics includes all of that stuff that you see on the slide there and more. Um, particularly, there's an increasing amount of work in, in cyber security, obviously plagiarism is an area, um, hate speech, hate crimes, and new emerging areas uh, constantly, including things like deception detection, which aren't yet represented in the International Journal of Speech, Language and the Law, but no doubt in a few years time will be. So that's as far as I want to go in terms of trying to define the scope of forensic linguistics for people who may be coming at it today for the first time. The second thing that I want to do is talk about three case studies um, in, in sequence. Um, these will be very familiar to some people who are in, the, in attendance um, this morning or this afternoon, wherever you're, you're watching or listening to this. Um, but for others, they represent a nice introduction as some very important and seminal early foundational case studies within the field upon which there's been decades of research built since. In each of these three case studies, I am deferring entirely to the excellent work of others. So I wasn't involved in any of this uh, work by any means. Um, in fact, for one of it, I wasn't alive. Um, but I today am here as a conduit or a vehicle through which to hopefully expose some of you to this for the first time. The Yorkshire Ripper hoax case and the Derek Bentley case are two classics in forensic speech science, I guess, and forensic linguistics, um, respectively, and laid the very early foundations of what's happened since. With the communication of rights, I want to speak about an area of the field that has had sustained efforts um, since the inception of, or the formal inception of forensic linguistics 30 odd years ago. So, <clears throat> The Yorkshire Ripper hoax was the first, um, or perhaps not the first, but certainly one of the most famous instances of what's called in the field speaker profiling. There are times when the police have a record of a criminal's voice, either committing to or confessing a crime, sorry, confessing or committing to a crime, but they have no suspect and therefore need to use all the resources available to them that might help them enable them to narrow down the group of potential suspects. Examples of recorded texts or recorded data that might be subject to this sort of analysis range from a threatening phone call, a ransom demand, bomb threat, extortion, or an actual audio recording of a, of a crime taking place. And in such cases, the forensic speech scientist or the forensic phonetician may be asked to undertake speaker profiling. Now, I should say that this sort of research um, and this sort of, not this sort of research necessarily, but certainly this sort of analysis is most often fundamental to the police investigation stage of any case. Um, it's rare to my knowledge, if ever, if ever, that speaker profiling has been reliably admitted as evidence to court, but it can serve as a useful stage in the investigation process when the police are trying to narrow down their suspects. So in some cases, forensic phoneticians can work hard to derive as much information as possible about the speakers on a particular recording all the speech are made available to them using both their expertise in phonetics and um, increasingly specialist software. The characteristics of a speaker that forensic speech scientists may be able to make a judgment on range from biological features such as uh, a speaker's age or sex to socio-cultural features such as geographical region and their first language. And obviously the identification of some of these personal features of individuals is more straightforward and reliable than that of others. One of the most addressable questions relates to where a person is from, or at least where they have lived. 
Um, in these cases, the expert closely examines the recording for identifiable features of accent, namely vowel and consonant realizations, but also lexical grammatical features of, of dialect. And once they've identified a pool of variables that may be useful in giving indication um, as to where a person speaking is from, if they're speaking with a particular accent or in a particular dialect, the expert then compares those features or variants or variables in the sample um, and compares it or verifies their findings with those of authoritative descriptions of language varieties, namely the language variation and sociolinguistics literature. And hopefully the forensic phonetician is then able to give some geographical profile of the speaker and ideally localizing them to where they are from or where they may have lived. One of the earliest cases and most famous cases of this in England occurred in the 1970s and the Yorkshire Ripper was a serial killer who between 1975 and 1979 murdered 10 women in the Leeds and Bradford area of Yorkshire. Between 1978 and 1979, West Yorkshire police, who were tasked with trying to find the Yorkshire Ripper, received three letters written by someone purporting to be the killer himself. They also received a tape recording featuring the voice of a man who alleged to be the murderer and called himself Jack the Ripper. Now, technology uh, dependent, we should be able to hear this recording and the transcript is on screen now. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. But Lord, you are no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. I reckon your boys are letting you down, George. They can't be much good, can they? The only time they came near catching me was a few months back in Chapel Town when I was disturbed. I warned you in March that I'd strike again. Sorry it wasn't Bradford. I'm not quite sure when I'll strike again. But it will be definitely sometime this year. I'm not sure where. Maybe Manchester. I like it there. There's plenty of them knocking about. They never learn, do they, George? I bet you've warned them, but they never listen. Well, it's been nice chatting to you, George. Yours, Chuck the Ripper. So hopefully you could all hear that. I can't see Zoom at all at the moment, so I don't know whether there's been lots of messages saying that you can't, but hopefully you could. This was long before forensic linguistics existed as a formal field. Um, of course, there had been a lot of linguists and dialectologists and phoneticians practicing their trade at this time. Stanley Ellis, who was a phonetician, a dialectologist and a lecturer at the University of Leeds, was called in by West Yorkshire police who asked him to identify or try to identify the accent of the speaker on that recording that you have hopefully just heard and pinpoint his regional origin which Ellis identified on the basis of the vowel realizations, consonant realizations, and uh, comparing what he found in the sample to the existent um, sociolinguistic and, and language variation literature, the resources, the literature that he had available to him. He identified the speaker as being from um, Sunderland, which, was in, which is in um, the northeast of England. So um, for those of you who either live in England or don't and don't know where Sunderland is. It's just up there, um, slightly south of Newcastle upon Tyne. More specifically, Ellis reported to the police that in his opinion, the man's voice represented someone who had been brought up in the Castletown or Southwark areas of Sunderland. Um, so his, the, the, the distinctiveness of the features in the sample alongside the available data um, survey data in the literature for this area, uh, Ellis made that approximation, but he did have reservations concerning the possibility that the speaker had no longer lived there. So following Ellis's um, opinion, there followed a long and expensive investigation in which the police focused their inquiries on men with a northeastern accent. Um, it saw hundreds of thousands of pounds spent on the publicity campaign, tens of thousands of men investigated, but to no avail. 
During the investigation, Ellis and others became concerned that the tape recording could be a hoax and therefore eliminating from the murder investigation all speakers who didn't have a Northeastern accent would be a mistake. Then, judging by, I mean, judging by the title of this slide, the Yorkshire Ripper hoax, you can tell that it was a mistake. In January 19, 1981, a few years later, Peter Sutcliffe, a lorry driver from Bradford, was arrested and accused of the Ripper murders. And in April 1981, he pleaded, though he pleaded not guilty to 13 charges, charges of murder, he pled guilty to 13 charges of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, claiming that he heard voices that had compelled him to kill these women. He also pleaded guilty to seven charges of attempted murder. After a two-week trial, Sutcliffe was found guilty of murder on all counts and was sentenced to 20 concurrent life sentences. So the so-called Yorkshire Ripper had been brought to justice. But Sutcliffe did not have a Sunderland accent. So Stanley Ellis, as noted in his 1994 report on the case, the identity of the man who sent the tape and letters had never been discovered. That was until 2005, 26 years after the tapes had been sent, when John Humble, was arrested and charged with sending the hoax letters and the tape to the police in the 1970s. He was caught because a review of cold cases using the latest DNA tests managed to identify Humble by matching his genetic profile with a sample of saliva taken from one of the envelopes in which one of the hoax letters had been sent in the original case. During the investigation, Humble's address was given as um, Fl Flodden Court for the state in the suburb of South Hilton in Sunderland. Just for context, this is the Castleton area, the Southwark area that Stanley Ellis approximated the speaker to be from, and that is South Hilton. The address is half a kilometre away from Southwark and Castleton, um, which had been identified as Alice, Ellis as the two likely places of origin, which means through the use of his sociolinguistic and dialectological expertise and analyses and the available literature at the time, Stanley Ellis was staggeringly accurate in his geographical pinpointing of the speaker on the tape. Since uh, the Yorkshire Ripper case, forensic speech science has exploded. There are a huge range of different areas and sub-disciplines within that umbrella um, subject of forensic speech science. Um, a lot of work increasingly going into um, developing automatic speaker recognition systems with some level of reliability. Forensic speaker comparison, I think I'm right in saying that that um, accounts for the vast majority of, well, the majority of work that a forensic speech scientist will be asked to do in terms of cases um, using both their auditory and acoustic skills, so both their skills as a phonetician, but also their use of specialist software for measuring certain elements of speech. But also now research has expanded into looking at areas that complicate that. So for instance, recordings over the telephone, recordings of suspects or voices who may be wearing a mask or disguising their voice in some way. There's also work in building population databases so that we have available to us for casework and research, reliable data on which to make or reliable data for averages in terms of things like pitch, um, intonation um, and speed of art rate of articulation. There's also work going into um, developing high standards of evidence for forensic speech scientists, also likelihood frameworks for expressing opinions. But also you've got the forensic transcription, which is where a phonetician is hopefully consulted to try and identify what may have been said in a clandestine or disputed recording. Speaker profiling um, is research still going into speaker profiling and also uh, ear witness evidence. And trying to set up parameters to achieve the best evidence from people who have heard a voice committing a crime but have not seen the voice, uh, seen the person, seen the voice, seen the, seen the speaker, and therefore can hopefully be able to identify the voice should they hear it again in, for instance, a voice parade. So moving now from forensic speech science to authorship attribution and authorship analysis, the Derek Bentley case is an often cited case um, of this. It's not the earliest case, but it's one of the most famous. In November 1952, two teenagers, Derek Bentley, pictured here, 
aged 19, and his friend Chris Craig, aged 16, were seen by a nearby witness climbing up onto the roof of a London warehouse. The police were called and surrounded the building, and shortly after, three unarmed officers climbed onto the roof to arrest Bentley and Craig. Bentley immediately surrendered and was arrested, but Craig started shooting, wounding one policeman and killing a second. Bentley was jointly charged with murder. In the original trial, the problem for the prosecution in making the case against Bentley was to demonstrate that he could be guilty of murder despite being under arrest when the murder was committed. Bentley's defense barrister laid out clearly in the original trial that there were two preconditions that the jury must be satisfied with in order to, be, uh, in order to rule that Bentley was guilty of murder. Those were that Bentley knew his friend had a gun and that he instigated or incited his friend to use it. Both of these criteria depended on the reliability of the witness statements that were given by both the arresting officers to the police after the incident and the statement that Bentley gave himself. Now at the time, one of the main ways, there were two ways, one of the main ways in which the statement would have been taken from Bentley is that he would give an unaided, uninterrupted monologue, his version of events would be given as a monologue, and the police would make a verbatim, word-for-word -word record as a written, written witness statement of what he said in that monologue. For point one, it was observed that in this statement, which pur purported, of course, to give an unaided account of the night's events, Bentley said the phrase, I did not know he was going to use the gun. In summing up, the judge emphasized that Bentley had said he didn't know he was going to use the gun with a definite article. Therefore, he must have known that Craig had a gun before any police officers made their way onto the roof. In addition, because later in his statement, Bentley said, I did not know Chris had a gun until he shot, the judge argued that this proved that Derek Bentley was at best an unreliable witness. For point two, the evidence used in support that Bentley instigated or incited Craig to use the gun was that the police officers in their statement and the evidence that they gave in court asserted that Bentley had uttered the words, let him have it, Chris, immediately before Craig shot and killed the policeman. As the judge emphasized, the strength of the evidence depended entirely on the credibility of the police officers who had recorded it and sworn to its accuracy. The trial lasted two uh, two days. It took place five weeks later, and both Craig and Bentley were found guilty, even though Bentley had been under arrest for some considerable time when the officer was killed. Both were found guilty of murder. Because Craig was legally a minor, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Because Bentley was aged 19, he was sentenced to death and hanged shortly afterwards. Bentley's family led a 45-year-long campaign to overturn that guilty verdict and have Derek Bentley's murder conviction posthumously quashed. This campaign ended in 1998 when the case came to appeal. In the appeal, the defense called into question the reliability of the statement that Bentley had allegedly given when he was arrested. So remember, the statement should have been taken by him giving an unaided monologue and the police writing down verbatim, word for word, what he said. That's what the prosecution argued. They argued that the statement was a verbatim record of an unaided monologue by Bentley to the police. But Bentley, who himself had severe special educational needs, asserted that the statement was at least in part the product of a question and answer dialogue in which the police had asked him questions and his replies to those questions had been conflated, combined and packaged up as if it was a monologue spoken by him alone. Now, without evidence of an audio or video recording, there was little opportunity to prove otherwise. However, the defense representing Bentley in appeal knew if they could throw doubt on the veracity of that statement and the police officers who took it, they could mitigate and undermine the strength of evidence that was used to both prosecute and convict Bentley in the original trial. Therefore, Bentley's repeated claims to the police that the police had um, at least co-constructed his statement that it was a joint effort rather than um, an accurate written record of what he had said to them as it should have been, this was of great interest. 
The police consulted Professor Malcolm Coulthard as a forensic linguist to analyze the statement allegedly spoken by Bentley to identify the possibility of there being one more or more than one authorial voice and to assess whether this statement was entirely the work of Derek Bentley or whether it was the work of Bentley and the police. In that analysis, one of the features of significant for, significance for Malcolm's analysis was that the alleged confession, or what amounted to a confession was the, in the statement, was the fre frequent use of the word then in its temporal sense. Now, this appeared 10 times in a short um, statement. The, short was, the statement was 583 words long. There were 10 occurrences of this. Now, at first, this doesn't seem remarkable at all, given the register of a, of a witness statement. Um, it, it's quite possible entirely that when reporting a series of sequential events, the use of the word then is going to be frequent. However, Malcolm had a hunch that the use of the word then was at least very atypical and could be a potential intrusion of a specific feature of police register rather than the register or the style or the authorial style of deriving, of deriving from a member of the general public. To test this hypothesis, Malcolm collected two additional data sets. So first we have the Derek Bentley statement, totaling 582 words. The first additional uh, data set was a, a corpus of 930 words, which was made up of three statements that were given by ordinary witnesses, members of the public. One from a woman involved in the Bentley case itself, and two from men involved in a completely unrelated case, but they were members of the public, and that totaled 930 words. The second comparison corpus that Malcolm used was, the, was a 2,270 word data set of three statements written by the police, two of whom were involved in the Bentley case and the third in another unrelated case. So we've got the Bentley statement, we've got other witness statements written and given by members of the public, and then we've got three witness statements written by the police. The frequency results were quite important. Whereas the ordinary witness statements only contained one use of the word then, occurring on average, therefore, 900, once every 930, uh, 930 words, the use of the word then appeared 29 times, which is a relative frequency of once every 78 words. So even this initial frequency analysis groups Bentley's statement far more closely to that of the police written statements rather than those statements given by other members of the public. This could be tested further by Malcolm by uh, using the corpus of spoken English, which at the time consisted of 1.5 million running words collected from many different types of naturally incurring speech. In that 1.5 million words, the use of the word then in its temporal sense appeared 3,164 times, or in other words, 100, uh, one instance every 500 words. Therefore, even at this stage, it became clear that the frequent use of the word then for Malcolm at least, is a feature characteristic of police register. They use it more than members of the public either generally, as represented in the corpus of spoken English, or when members of the public are given witness statements, as in the other witness statement data. Therefore, Malcolm gave the opinion that frequent use of the word then in the Bentley statement may suggest that it had been written at least in part by the police rather than entirely uh, given by Bentley himself. But it wasn't just the frequency of the word then that was of interest in this analysis, but also the grammatical structure in which it appeared. You can see on the slide now four instances of the pattern subject plus then. I then, Craig and I then, Chris then, and Chris then. This subject plus then grammatical structure is marked. It appeared seven times in the 582 word Bentley statement. Using the same comparison corpus to check the relative frequencies in those other data sets, it appears only nine times in 1.5 million words of spoken English in the corpus of spoken English. That's twice as often, twice more frequently, sorry, twice more frequently in 1.5 million words 
than in 582 words of Bentley's statement. In contrast, the alternative, then plus subject, so then I, for instance, appeared 10 times as frequently in the spoken of Corpus English. The subject plus then pattern didn't appear at all in the other witness statements written by members of the public, but it was found 26 times in the statements written by the police. Therefore, not only do normal speakers use then much less frequently than police officers, when they do, they use it overwhelmingly in a structurally different way to the police. Malcolm argued, when working as part of the appeal, that such examples embedded in Bentley's statement of the language of the police officers who'd recorded it, added support to the claim that this was a jointly authored statement, not a monologue produced by Bentley, but a co-creation, at least to some extent, with involvement by the police. This therefore obviously undermined the evidence in the statement, in particular removed the incriminating force of the phrase, I didn't know he was going to use the gun, as it could no longer be reliably inferred that Bentley had ever said that when giving his statement. It also undermined far more broadly the credibility of the police officers on whose word it depended that he had said, let him have it, Chris. In August 1998, the Lord Chief Justice, sitting with two of his senior colleagues, criticised the judge's handling of the original case. The appeal was successful and his conviction was quashed 46 years after he was executed. The Derek Bentley case, as I've said, is an often referred to case. But authorship analysis in the same way as forensic speech science has developed a long way since um, Malcolm's report of this case in 1994. I should say that both um, Malcolm's report and Stanley Ellis's report appear in the first volume of the International Journal of Speech, Language and the Law. So that's, we're talking seminal fundamental case studies here. But authorship analysis now concerns itself with testing different linguistic features to see how effective they are in determining the authorship of a document in different sorts of texts. There's also similar in the case of forensic speech science, authorship analysis. Some cases of authorship analysis can benefit from a stylometric or a quantitative statistical approach which is being developed. Some recent, well I say there's not one stylometric approach, in fact it's quite a disparate group of approaches. There's also been efforts to try and combine the benefits of the linguistic stylistic analysis with those of statistics. Researchers in authorship analysis are trying to see how effective their methods are when dealing with very small texts. Often cases in forensic authorship analysis are very, very small. It could be one letter, it could be five or six text messages or instant messages. So a lot of research has gone into that also. Increasingly, there's some research going on to see whether we can identify writers when they're writing across different genres or when they're writing in different languages. And there is some work on the development of population data sets and standards to try and ensure that evidence given by forensic linguists in case of authorship analysis is reliable. And finally, departing a little bit from my style of, of giving individual case studies, um, I now want to shift to look at an area in the discipline that has received sustained interest and research over the life of forensic linguistics, and that is the importance of the ways in which a person's rights are communicated to them once they become involved in the legal process. Now, I'm going to focus on England and Wales here, um, but research and practice has found these sorts of issues occurring across the world in many different countries and many different jurisdictions. On the slide now is the caution in England and Wales. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. This is presented to individuals by the police, it's said by the police when they are arrested, and then it's repeated immediately before these individuals are interviewed by the police. It consists of only three sentences, but they are incredibly important three sentences. Their function is to ensure that those individuals who become involved in criminal proceedings know their fundamental rights under the law, including the right of an individual not to incriminate themselves during that process. Now, if these, processes, if these rights aren't appropriately communicated, protected, or understood, this risks the integrity of any criminal investigation. 
it risks the quality or the admissibility of evidence. Therefore, the delivery of these rights, in this case, the caution, is what Larry Solon and Peter Tiersma describe as the first critical step in potentially a long legal process that may involve interrogation, trial, sentencing, and even prison. Frances Rock, in her 2012 chapter on the caution in England and Wales, in Solon and Tiersma's uh, Oxford Handbook of Language and the Law, emphasizes that detainees' decisions about how to respond to these three sentences can be life-changing. And I quote, the specific sets of implications and upshots from speech and silence in the legal process are extremely consequential. These rights are being read hundreds of thousands of times to hundreds of thousands of suspects every year in England and Wales. And the official wording, Francis uh, continues, if misunderstood, can cause huge yet potentially invisible problems for the justice system and ultimately for society, most obviously creating miscarriages of justice or unnoticed injustice. It is crucially important that individuals understand the caution so that they understand their rights in the criminal justice system. Now, to help ensure that individuals in police custody do understand their rights, police officers in England and Wales are advised by their codes of practice that they should explain the caution to suspects at the start of every police interview. Police aren't regulated in how they do this. They're, they're very, it's very much up to them how they arrive at this agreed upon meaning. But that means that discourse event is an important space in which forensic linguists can and have analyzed how this meaning is negotiated and achieved or not. In this case, again, taken from Francis's 2012 chapter, we have a short transcript of the beginning of an interview between P, which is police, and D, which is detainee. Just explain to me what you think the caution means. Um, it means that I have the right to remain silent unless, you know, I wish to speak. Um, yeah. It will be used in evidence against me. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to say anything now when I'm asking you questions. If you fail to mention something now and then bring it up in court, it wouldn't be listened to us. Yeah, well, they would listen, but they would, they'd say, why didn't you mention it in court? It might carry less weight. Yeah. Apologies for reading out the transcript. Um, I'm not going to put different voices on, but there we are. In this case, the interviewing officer and the suspect seemingly work together to arrive at an agreed upon meaning of the caution and the interview can proceed. The police officer is happy that the detainee understands their rights and the interview can carry on. But there are several factors which can and do complicate this process of understanding. And one such factor is when the suspect doesn't have English as a first language. I'm going to, I'm going to show you over the next few slides a, a portion of talk in which this is the case. And the customs officer in this case, that's the legal participant, um, a suspect who doesn't have English as a first language, and a solicitor try and negotiate the meaning of the caution. So, the customs officer, you don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you relate a lie on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand the caution? And the suspect responds, no. So this is obviously a problematic case. We then see the customs officer try to explain this to the suspect. You don't understand the caution. The caution is, I, I'll repeat it to you again. You don't have to say anything, okay, but it may harm your defense if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. So basically, if we ask you questions, uh, you don't have to say anything, but if you don't, it may harm your defense if it goes to court and you have to speak for yourself about it. It could harm your defense if you don't mention anything, okay? And anything you do say may be given in evidence, okay? The solicitor then interjects and asks his client, do you understand that? The suspect then has an attempt to arrive at an agreed upon meaning. Anything me say how different, sir? Anything, what do you mean by that? I don't really catch what they're saying, man. The customs officer then says, well, if we ask you a question, you don't have to answer it. Okay, that is your legal right. The suspect responds, the answer that I'll use, use by me in court. Customs officer says, yes. The customs officer uh, continues by saying, yes, but if you don't answer any questions, it may harm your defense in court if you go to court. And if you don't answer any of the questions, it could harm your defense when you get to court, depending on what your defense is if you go to court. Okay? No reply. 
The solicitor says, if you don't understand it, Mr. Name of Suspect, you must tell the officer you don't understand. Do you understand the explanation he's giving? Suspect, no. Customs officer turns to the solicitor and says, well, can you explain it any clearer? The solicitor responds, um, I've had difficulty in explaining it. I would not be certain that I could persuade, convince myself that Mr. Suspect understands what the caution means. Is that because he doesn't understand the English language or I suspect that our communication uh, in is not as good as it could be, is it? You and I, or even including the customs officers, don't understand exactly what each, each of us are saying. Is that right? The suspect then gives an inaudible turn. The customs officer then says, does he need an interpreter? In what language? I don't know. What language would he understand? The solicitor says, it's your interview. You are interviewing him. The customs officer says to the suspect, what language would you understand? And then after this, we arrive at the, uh, the realization that uh, we have a, a, a speaker who would understand uh, Jamaican Creole. Now, this is a case taken from Brown, Blake and Chambers. It's a case from the United Kingdom. But this issue has attracted decades worth of research in forensic linguistics, as indeed has the role of interpreters and translators far more generally, not just in England and Wales, but across the world. Some of these efforts culminated in 2015 in the setting up of the Communication of Rights Group and the published guidelines for communicating rights to non-native English speakers in Australia, England and Wales and the USA. The Communication of Rights Group is an international group of, uh, upon foundation, 21 linguists, psychologists, lawyers and interpreters. They outline the challenges here in the preamble to the guideline themselves. They say, for many reasons, which I'm not going to uh, repeat because they're on the slide here, but for, there's many reasons why an adult who doesn't have English as a first language, um, may not even have English as a second or third language, can have communication difficulties um, particularly comprehension difficulties when it comes to engaging with the legal process. Now, the engagement with the legal process goes beyond having a normal, you know, decent standard of conversational English because there are implications, there are assumptions made in the adversarial system, such as that we have in England and Wales, that make uh, non native English speakers of, of English a vulnerable population. And these guidelines that they set up do two things. They make recommendations, one, in terms of the wording of the rights or the cautions themselves in these countries, and two, how these rights and cautions are communicated to non-native English speakers. They give seven uh, recommendations. I've summarized these here. These aren't the uh, official names that they're given. But first, they argue that um, Unfamiliar legal jargon or legal lexicon are passive and agentless constructions, grammatically complex sentences with multiple clauses and sentences with conditional clauses are replaced with frequent familiar terms, single clause sentences and the active voice in so-called plain English. Second, they say that the preparation, testing and rolling out should be implemented of all vital legal documents, including their rights, liberties, and legal assistance to suspects in languages other than English. They should be provided at the beginning of the interview to request the services of a professional interpreter and then asked again throughout the interview if they initially decline. They argue that each right should be presented individually and that they should be delivered clearly at a slow pace and that the suspect should be given time to read each right and give an opportunity to ask questions. Interestingly, they argue that it's not enough to rely on yes or no questions to determine whether the suspect understands what's being said to them. Either a yes to do you understand the caution or the yes to do you understand English is not sufficient evidence of understanding or language proficiency. Indeed, there are many reasons why a suspect might answer yes to that or any other question in the context of a police interview. Penultimately, they argue that there should be extended across jurisdictions a process in which to determine suspect understanding is to ask the suspect to read or explain it in their own words, the, the understanding and uh, their understanding of the meaning of each right. If that's not possible, the interview should be terminated until an appropriate interpreter can be found. And finally, 
They argue that the communication of rights and the explanation by suspects should be video recorded in each instance to provide evidence to the court as to whether rights were properly communicated and understood. So these three very different case studies represent a microcosm of some of the work that forensic linguists do both in their research and in their casework. And there are three ways in which we attempt to achieve the aim of improving the delivery of justice through language analysis. As shown by the survey at the start, um, the bar charts that I put up at the start, there are many, many more ways in which this has been and is being worked towards, but hopefully presenting two classic case studies and one perennial issue, uh, which is in fact increasingly important in increasingly multilingual contexts, I provided you with some insight into the nature and motivation for some of the work in forensic linguistics. But forensic linguistics is an international effort. It requires the education and training at undergraduate, postgraduate, and professional level. So ideally, each country has its pool of forensic linguists. A good first step towards this aim would be the development and establishment of degree level courses in forensic linguistics, especially in countries where the field is yet to be developed. Um, a lot of work in forensic linguistics is in the Anglo-speaking um, country, countries, particularly the UK, the US, uh, Australia, and in some cases, New Zealand, but there are areas emerging internationally and that needs to be harnessed and expanded. And that's often up to universities and departments who have the skills and expertise within their departments to help develop formal programs in this discipline and help increase the international visibility of forensic linguistic work. For instance, um, at uh, the University of Santiago. So that's the references to the, um, to the case studies and other resources that I mentioned throughout the talk. And now I believe, um, even though I've run slightly over time, uh, we have some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for such a wonderful talk. I think, uh, yeah, you clarify most of the, the most, let's say, um, important aspects of French linguistics. You know, you covered some of the different areas lots of people do not or did not know about uh, the, this field a lot so now probably they do so thank you for <laughs> some of it some that. of it Jose. yeah some, some of, of it. it thank you yeah because uh, uh, it is really broad and i have some questions here uh the first question says david is there a line of research in forensic linguistics that takes into account nonverbal language um yes there is so obviously i mean in terms of nonverbal language that um you know, that can cover a multitude of different areas. So for instance, I know that there's work, I'll answer this in a couple of parts and hopefully it, it satisfies the asker um, or the askers. But yes, I know that in, for instance, in a police interview context, there's work ongoing to see how important nonverbal communication is in beh on behalf uh, or in terms of um, the nonverbal behavior of the, of the, the interviewee primarily. Um, the one that springs to mind immediately is the use of nonverbal communication with regards to detecting deception and lies. Now, I say this reticently and I say it with a, a huge chunk of caution because the research literature is not in agreement uh, with each other. Um, and really it's not within the remit of forensic linguists nor um, forensic phoneticians, hopefully any of those in the in the attendance would back me up on this, but it's not within our remit to give any formal judgments as to whether anyone is telling the truth or not through verbal or otherwise means. But yeah, there are areas, although, but like, like, like every other field, um, multimodal analysis is, is very much playing catch up in what has ultimately been a, a heavily verbal and textual based field. Um, but the one that springs to mind is nonverbal communication in deception detection um, and increasingly nonverbal behavior in um, institutional discourse, Gilly, police interviews, and courtroom discourse. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. There is another question that talks about plagiarism. You know, yeah. is there you know a connection between you know <laughs> the idea of uh, if we think of from a you know a university perspective that, that we need to catch our students red-handed, you know, when they <laughs> <laughs> quote or cite sure. you know a resource very well? Is there a connection between plagiarism and forensic linguistics? Do you see a connection between those two areas? Yes. So absolutely. So some of my closest colleagues. Um, in forensic linguistics have, the speci have a specialism in plagiarism. Plagiarism in and of itself isn't necessarily a legal problem. 
um, so the text wouldn't necessarily be a, a forensic problem. But of course, when the texts do, um, for whatever reason, you know, flout any law or become criminal in any way, then of course, um, plagiarism can be a forensic linguistic problem. And the way that I conceptualize it anyway, and hopefully any plagiarism analysis wouldn't won't be too um, upset by this, is that it's a branch of forensic authorship analysis. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, David, when do you feel or think, or do you, do you really think that forensic linguistics has been recognized as a formal field, or is it still on that, or is it still on the way to be recognized as a formal field? Um, well, there's two answers. I'm going to answer that in two ways. The first way is that it's recognized in, it's already recognized in, in terms of, you know, there are people who do PhDs and undergraduate degrees and master's degrees in forensic linguistics. So it's, it's recognized and established insofar as, you know, quote unquote, the academy, at least in the areas, at least in the geographical areas that I mentioned at the end, you know, England, um, well, the UK, <clears throat> the US, and some, some areas of, of Australia and New Zealand. Um, but in terms of forensic linguistic practitioners, casework, um, it, it's, it's admitted in court uh, regularly um, as, a, as a, you know, forensic linguists regularly act as expert witnesses. Um, obviously, with any, with, with, with any new forensic science, you know, the comparisons that are often drawn are with the likes of forensic linguistics and DNA analysis or fingerprint analysis, which obviously has a longer tradition and is more, um, more rec not, not more recognized, but more regularly um, encountered by not only the courts, but also jurors and the general public. Um, but, you know, forensic speech science, for instance, um, there are hundreds of cases a year, forensic linguistics also. So it's recognized by universities, at least in this country, at least in the UK, and it's recognized by the courts insofar as forensic linguists are often asked um, to be expert witnesses, either, you know, to give expert evidence in, in court or to assist um, the police in their investigation. So yes, absolutely. Obviously, there's lots, lots of ways to go. That's what I'm saying about the standards and that sort of thing. There's always going to be a judge or, or, or someone who might be a little bit skeptical, but a lot of the work is ultimately making sure that the, 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 the research and the practice that does see the light of day is of a good standard so that we can develop that, that reputation as being a, a, a legitimate and a reliable science. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question and if, or maybe, I don't know, one or two. Yep. Uh, here we've got a question from uh, somebody whose first language is Dutch. So, okay. you know, that we, you, you talked about the communication of rights, which is mm. difficult, you know, for non-native speakers, but also for native speakers of oh, a certain sure. language. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he, uh, Max, he's saying that, you know, in the Netherlands, the governmental approach is to publish the documents at a B2 level of Dutch to improve comprehension. Right. You know, do you know if there is such a moving legal process as well? Or would you recommend that, you know, like simplifying the language of, you know, communication of rights, especially, or other legal terms? Yes, absolutely. I would support anything that, um, anything that at the same time makes it easier for vulnerable suspects and vulnerable witnesses generally. You know, yeah, you mentioned, of course I would support that. I'm not sure, to be perfectly honest, how far we are, in you know these the the guidelines that I suggested were published in, that I quoted sorry were published in 2015, but only in England and Wales, um, the you know, only four or at least targeted towards England and Wales, the US, and uh, Australia. I'm not sure how much progress has been made on that front. Um, I would love to see you know written documents given um, written to a particular level of comprehension. Um, I would support that of course. People who are part of the communication of rights group, I'm sure, would have a more satisfactory answer to that. Um, but you mentioned there, Jose, that it's not just uh, <laughs> second language speakers of English or any language who have trouble with this. It's there are a lot of hidden assumptions that are that are packaged within these cautions and these rights. To which, when people say, "Do you understand?" they say yes when they're done. So I think that any any measures that go to improving comprehensibility need to. Um, need to reach not just non-native non speakers of these languages, but any. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
you know, I think there's just uh, time for one more question. And David, I don't know if you would like, maybe I can, you know, take all the questions and send you, uh, I don't know, an email or yes, something. Yes, I would. Look, yeah, I would do that. Yeah, I would write that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, because I think we've got tons of questions uh, okay. here. And, uh, Sorry if I well, went on too long. I went on for 53 minutes, which is longer than I was allocated, I think, Jose. So that's my fault. Oh, yeah, it's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> and also, yeah, because since it was a very interesting talk and probably there are so many different different types of questions. So, um, for example, the, the, the case you mentioned, the Derek Bentley case, mm. you know, um, this is more like a, a, a comment, you know, more than, let's say, sure. a question. Um, you know, I think that there is a need in a way for a large scale digital humanities project. You know, well, we have all these cases, you know, maybe... Uh, especially when it, uh, it, many people are, let's say, uh, prosecuted uh, based on their uh, statements they give, you know, so that's, let's say, the importance of statements. Let's say it's really, um, it's paramount. And also the idea of, you said that the access to information is very difficult. Mm. So let's say here, uh, the comment is basically that, do you think that it would be ideal to have some sort of, let's say, corpus of statements from different languages, you know, to have access to that? But let's say in your experience, I'm pretty sure that's very difficult, right? To access statements or because there are legal procedures to follow. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would love nothing more than to have a huge data set of any forensic, forensically relevant texts. Um, the, I suppose the, the, the question about getting access to those, I mean, it is a fundamentally important, um, fundamentally important area of the field is that um, and I suppose England and Wales, at least, have, have gotten around the sort of thing we see in the Bentley case by every interview being recorded, um, at least audio, increasingly video. So although that data isn't accessible for research, at least in the first instance, it, isn't, it is when it gets to, to, to trial. If there's any question like Bentley had that, you know, I didn't say that or this isn't me, then, you know, they could always go to the original recording. I do know that the um, Aston's Institute for Forensic Linguists is in the process now recently funded for five million pounds recently funded um, part of that is to uh, make publicly available a forensic linguistic data bank which will include hopefully lots of data for the very first time on the scale that we've never seen before to address exactly the sort of concern that you have Jose and and, and that other people have in that you know we, we'll all have students who really really want to do this work and they say I really want to analyze police interviews but the, the data is really difficult to get to and I suppose this links to the first question which is the more familiar people are with forensic linguistics across the world the more established it is the easier it will be to build relationships with the institutions that we need to build relationships with to get access to this data more easily. Absolutely okay thank you very much I'm going to do my best to collect all the questions because I think we've got many questions but I okay. think we've run out of time I don't know if Anouk would like to say something. Uh, to finish the uh, this wonderful presentation by uh, David. Yes, no, I think first of all, it was very, very interesting. And I think we have time for one more question if needed, because I see a lot of interest there. So please okay. go at one more. One more, one more? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so like one more question, absolutely. Okay. Um, here, well, Let's say there are lots of questions related to the communication of right, you know, like uh, the, the uh, importance of, of, of those. Well, I think I'm going to select this question. What are the implications of forensic linguistics for translation studies, especially in times when terrorism is a global, you know, it's a globally on the rise. Is, is it really important, for example, to include that in translation studies, like, like the, the area of forensic linguistics? Or, yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, it's, you know, the, the translation and interpreting it, it's, you know, there are lots of two, two high stakes contexts spring to mind immediately when it comes to the application of the skills, the unique skills in many ways that translators and interpreters have. One is the medical context and the other is legal context. And especially in the context of organized crime, which is increasingly digital, it's increasingly international. Of course, we need the, uh, the, the skills of, of translators and interpreters to be able to apply their skills in, in those sorts of contexts. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, David. Excellent. I think that's actually a quite nice pers perspective for the people listening. And I, I see yes. some in the comments like master students and from a lot of different places. So what I would recall from, from your presentation, well, first of all, it was very complete with a lot of interesting and <laughs> sometimes even frightful uh, sure, yeah, yeah. Like insights on, on what's been happening in the past and in historical like cases that mm. 
are nowadays references in the field. So um, yes, I, I would like to add one question if I may. Okay, uh, sure. Personally, it, it's I. How do you see the different developments in a more international level? As we have different kinds of nationalities here, is there like a, a country that's referenced in this field? I've heard you talking about UK, the US, mm. but where do you see new developments coming up? And, and I was quite interested as well uh, about the fact that you talked a lot about dialects and how this mm. influences a lot the interpretation of the origin of people. Uh, and for us, for example, in Chile, uh, it's, it's quite different um, in the way that the dialect is different or not from one place to another, which is a sure. lot less than, well, I'm Dutch, I'm used to having a, a different dialect in every village. Yeah, uh, yeah, that yeah. doesn't happen a lot in Chile, for example. So how does this kind of things uh, differ in an international field and scope of interpretation of this kind of um, applied uh, linguistics, to say in some way? I suppose my answer to that would be, I mean, it's obviously a great, great question and an important point. My answer to that would be, in my vision, I suppose, to that would be, for what it's worth, um, that forensic linguistics is, 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 I say just, it's only the application of um, linguistic analysis, be, be that dialectology, sociolinguistics, stylistics, translation. It's only the application of those to a particular context. So my answer to your question about sort of which countries do I see this developing and emerging in, it's any country where these sorts of issues happen. And I would argue that that's probably every country in the world. Um, what we'd need to try and do is, is harness the, the linguistic expertise that's already there in these areas that are applied in the legal context and shift the, shift the focus and, and introduce this new this 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 relatively new at least context for applying those skills and disciplines but yeah of course i mean the uk is a little bit you know like like the netherlands where there's a different different dialect every every village but the, the stanley ellis case is a perfect example of that he wasn't a forensic linguist he was a dialectologist asked to give an opinion in a, in a case um so i suppose that set the blueprint for uh, other countries making the developments and the establishments as of forensic linguistics as a is a field in its own right excellent thank you very much well i think this would be the perfect timing to well give you some rest as well you've been talking a lot <laughs> so, yeah, sorry <laughs> no 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 it was excellent I, I really want to appreciate uh as well as you being present here in the name of, of nothingham university in that, in that uh, point of view to jose luis of course from our department of linguistics yes, as well thank you jose <laughs> We really appreciate uh, being able to visualize our international network and give the opportunity to both sides and interested people in the field to keep going on the debate, even though we physically uh, can't be moving around right now a lot. So we really know that's a, that's a hard issue for research areas in particular. Uh, you would say that linguistics is not depending on any laboratories or stuff, but still uh, the pandemic is having its impact on research and any kind of field. So. Uh, we really hope that this uh, debate uh, has helped to to open up a little bit uh, the sphere of, of well, exchanging ideas and, and uh, help to get new concrete proposals uh, going on. I don't know if Jose Luis wants to add anything to round up, but I just really want to stress the fact that we're very grateful to David and to Jose Luis and that we really hope to keep seeing you in the future and who knows, maybe someday in Chile. <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank David, yeah, for accepting, you know, my invitation. And yeah, I mean, the, this is something I really wanted to present here in Chile. And I, I, I always thought that David was the right person to do so. So thank you for accepting the invitation. Yeah, uh, of course, yeah, the idea would be for um, David to come to Chile so he can do that in person. But yeah, we'll see how we, we can make that happen. And, of course, uh, yes. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I think this was a really great talk, David. So you presented lots of interesting ideas and examples. And now I think it's our turn in Chile to start, you know, developing this area, you know, uh, now, I would say. Yes, please. Yeah. I was, yeah I, was, I, was, I, was, I was I was going to say in the future, but we could just do it now. <laughs> Brilliant. So, Thank you very much. That, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Yes. Why wait, wait? Well, just because there's some comments also in the chat, just to repeat, we will be uploading the recording of this webinar as well on our website. So any people that like to review again, parts of the presentation or any other information, please feel free to have a look at the link. It will be uploaded during afternoon or tomorrow morning early in the case needed. And if not, you can also contact us by international.usach.cl, which is international at usach.cl. 
So many thanks again for everyone. We hope you have a very good afternoon, morning, wherever, what time zone you are. And thank you very much again for joining us today. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.